G'day and welcome to the Powerful Learning Channel. My name's Luke Rowe and I'm a university lecturer and researcher who specializes in evidence-based teaching and the science of learning. And in today's episode, we're gonna be putting the spotlight on a book that I absolutely adore called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. It's by Peter Brown, Henry Rodiger, and Mark McDaniel. These guys are absolute heavyweights in the learning sciences community. So we'll sort fact from fiction with what they have to say in this book that is absolutely bursting with strategies that are gonna help your learning stick. Now there are five different principles that I've extracted from this book to go through with you today. And the first of these is to debunk the myth that rereading texts and reviewing notes are effective study strategies. They might feel easy, but they don't necessarily promote deep learning and robust learning. At least not as we usually engage in these practices where we mindlessly reread over and over in the hope that eventually by sheer repetition, something's gonna stick in our minds. And that's been proven to be a terribly inefficient way to learn. Instead, we've got to engage in retrieval practice. And retrieval practice basically refers to any strategy that forces you to bring the information or the knowledge from the long-term memory systems into the forefront of your mind. So you're actively retrieving it, reconstructing that knowledge and helping it interact with new material that you're engaging with, say, for example, through your reading or questions and answers through perhaps the most common way to do this through quizzing, low stakes or no stakes quizzes. That's probably the most common way to engage in retrieval practice. But what's really novel and interesting about the book is it offers a whole lot of, I think, more powerful ways to engage in retrieval practice. One example is that you can create your own questions while you're reading these books, right? So if you've got a book that you have to remember a whole lot of material from, start to list and develop your own question set in advance. So that you've got your quiz sheet, with your own questions that you've generated. And therefore, when you engage in reading, you're looking for information to answer those questions. As the authors put it, trying to solve a problem before being taught the solution leads to better learning even when errors are made in that attempt. And that's because it helps us engage in effortful retrieval of our learning and it hones us in on the relevant information. So when we have an incomplete mental model, that we generate through asking questions, we start to focus on the information that's gonna fill those gaps and complete those mental models. And therefore, we're gonna be more robust and more efficient in how we engage in the reading of that material. And given that we've asked the question, we answer it, and we start to encode and reconstruct the knowledge in a more powerful way. So that's just one way to engage in a powerful form of retrieval practice, asking yourself and generating your own questions before you engage in reading and rereading so that you can refine uh, your knowledge and make it more robust as you continue to bring it to the forefront of your mind and interact with that material. The second idea from the book, Make It Stick, involves the power of interleaving. And this essentially involves mixing up different topics or skills during our learning. It's kind of like cross-training for our brain. And what we know from the scientific literature about interleaving is that this strategy works best for areas of learning where different categories or skills are easily confused, such as different styles of painting or trying to recognize different species of birds. Another important distinction here is that interleaving can also be thought of as the opposite to blocked practice. And that's where we learn or master a discrete topic or skill before moving on to the next topic or skill. In essence, blocked practice is basically study that focuses on a single topic at a single time, and it might feel productive and fluent in your learning. However, we know from the research that it simply doesn't cut it compared to interleaved practice. The underlying reason why interleaving works much better than blocked practice is that interleaved practice helps our brains learn to recognize and discriminate between subtle categorical distinctions between different topics or skills, which is a mental skill in itself that tends to be neglected or not really addressed properly with other learning strategies. So how do we do this? Well, the examples given in the book are alternating math problems, vocabulary rules, and history facts. And it even works for motor skills like throwing a beanbag. In fact, they open the chapter 
with a reference to a study by Karen Booth, a famous study with throwing beanbags from either two feet or four feet away for one half of the group of students who engaged in that practice. So that was the varied practice or the interleaved practice. And another half of students who engaged in throwing at the three feet, which was what the original testing conditions was going to be. So both sets of students, half of them engaged in interleaved practice, throwing the beanbag into a bucket from two feet and four feet away, and another half of students only focusing on throwing the beanbag three feet from the bucket. And who do you think did better in the end? It was the students who were two and four feet away during their practice who did better on the ultimate test 12 weeks later than the students who threw it three feet, even though the end test for that aptitude test, that physical aptitude test, was at the three foot mark, right? So the brain uh, tends to develop a broader understanding of the relationship between conditions and the movements required to succeed in them. So you can discern the context better and develop a more flexible, what they call movement vocabulary. So different movements, in different situations. So the basic lesson here is that your brain loves variety. And it's also important to remind yourself that even when interleave practice feels more difficult compared to alternative forms of practice like blocked practice, these feelings are not factual and they're more likely to, uh, you're more likely to learn the material when you're engaged in effortful interleaving. And Brown and colleagues illustrate this with a beautiful quote. They say that learning that's easy is like writing in the sand here today and gone tomorrow. The third big idea from the book, Make It Stick, is that making errors during retrieval practice is a good thing. So this kind of studying can be thought of as errorful learning rather than erroneous learning. And from that perspective, our mistakes become our friends rather than our foes because they allow us to see and address the gaps in our knowledge. It also highlights a fundamental aspect of how our brains are wired. We learn more when we set ourselves up to be corrected, and we learn less when we simply confirm our prior expectations. And I think the authors illustrate this beautifully with this quote, unsuccessful attempts to solve a problem encourage deep processing of the answer when it is later supplied, creating fertile ground for its encoding in a way that simply reading the answer cannot. It's better to solve a problem than to memorize a solution. It's better to attempt a solution and supply the incorrect answer than not to make the attempt. So the bottom line is that we need not fear mistakes. They deepen our understanding of problems and they make our learning more robust. They give us an opportunity to unearth our ignorance and correct our errors. And that is one of the fundamental aspects of how our brains are wired because they are wired to learn. And this point came in really handy when I was learning how to code as a part of my training in my graduate studies. It was a very error-prone process and a cumbersome process, and I found myself getting incredibly frustrated, tying my mind up in knots, trying to figure out how to code in various coding forms. And despite the feelings of frustration and the friction that it caused me in my learning, it turned out to be one of the best adult learning experiences that I've ever had, and it left me in really good stead to complete my PhD and move on to more complex research programs. So I don't regret the difficulty and the complexity and the errors that I had to wade through to learn those skills. It's just part of the territory there. And the fourth big idea from Make It Stick is about spacing out our practice sessions over time, often referred to simply as spaced repetition, spaced practice, or even distributed practice. It's kind of like watering a plant regularly with little bits often instead of drowning it all at once and trying to not water it for the next two weeks. Another important distinction that can be made here is that spaced practice can be thought of as the opposite to massed practice where we have a cramming session, for example, where we spend a lot of hours concentrated into one or a couple of study sessions. So big marathon study sessions rather than doing smaller study sessions interspersed throughout a longer period of time. So whenever you're feeling tempted to do that, to cram and to leave it till the last minute, know that the research favors space practice over mass practice in a big way. I mean, the results are unequivocal. Space practice vastly enhances our retention and our long-term learning compared to situations where we engage in mass practice with only a few rare exceptions. 
right? And that's with the initial learning sequence, perhaps where we can have mass practice sessions to really get our initial grasp of the material or acquire an initial skill or initially acquire a skill. But after that, really, when you start to want to process that information deeply and encode it deeply, deeply within your long-term memory and make it robust and resilient towards forgetting, that's when your space practice comes in and in involves refining that, retrieving it in spaced repetition over time. So the basic take home here is that once we've mastered the material and acquired that knowledge, we should review it just before we forget it. Right? So if our exam's at the end of the week, then you're reviewing it maybe every couple of days. If the exam's at the end of the month, then you might be reviewing every week. Right? If it's at the end of the year, then you might be reviewing every couple of weeks. And the authors remind us that as with interleaved practice, distributing or spacing our practice apart can often feel effortful and clunky and frustrate us. However, we need to console that frustration and tell ourselves and remind ourselves regularly that effortful learning is sometimes a good thing. This is a desirable difficulty, right? Because we know that these difficulties are analogous to the same difficulties of working out and breaking a sweat in the gym. That effort is gonna to lead to better outcomes than when we engage in the easy kinds of practice that won't lead to gains in the gym or with our learning. And the authors remind us that as with interleaved practice, distributing or spacing our practice apart can often feel effortful and clunky. But you should take comfort in the fact that each time you space your learning apart, you're going to eventually know far more and do far more compared to the person who masses it or concentrates it all together into a single or just a few marathon study sessions. So little bits often will get you far better outcomes than concentrating all your eggs into the single study basket through, say, for example, cramming. Now, the fifth and final idea that I think Make It Stick did a really good job of was to highlight the problem of what the authors refer to as illusions of knowing. And that's the mistaken belief that we've mastered material just because it feels familiar or was easy to read or comprehend. And I'm sure you've had this experience while you're breezing through a textbook chapter and you're thinking, yep, I've got this, I've nailed it, only to stumble on that same question or topic when it was presented later on an exam or test. Now that's the illusion of knowing in action. It's the mental mirage that makes us feel overconfident in our abilities and overestimate how much we know and can do. And I think the authors of Make It Stick do a really good job of providing a bit of a wake up call by stressing that robust learning isn't a walk in the park. It's often very difficult and requires strategies that might feel like a workout for your brain. They might feel difficult and frustrating, but they pay off. And as they say in the book, good judgment is a skill one must acquire, becoming an astute observer of one's own thinking and performance. We start at a disadvantage for several reasons. One is that when we're incompetent, we tend to overestimate our competence and see little reason to change. Another is that as humans, we are readily misled by illusions, cognitive biases, and stories we construct to explain the world around us and our place within it. To become more competent or even expert, we must learn to recognize competence when we see it in others become more accurate judges of what we ourselves know and don't know, adopt learning strategies that get results, and find objective ways to track our progress. So let's just quickly recap those five key ideas or key principles of learning from Make It Stick. The first was to engage in retrieval practice instead of simply rereading or re-watching some material in the hope that as you do over and over again, somehow it's all gonna stick. It doesn't work like that. It's gotta be effortful, from the back of the mind and the long-term memory to the forefront of your mind. The second idea involved the power of interleaving or mixing up your learning to improve your ability to categorize and transfer your learning. The third idea was to embrace our mistakes and to know that errors can be our best friends when it comes to learning so long as we find ways to correct them and hyper-correct them, they'll be encoded more deeply. The fourth key idea was to space our learning apart and engage in what we refer to as distributed practice. And that's where we do small bouts of study spread across time with spaces in between them and repeating that study and that mastery over and over again, 
rather than concentrating it into a single massed study session. And the fifth and final point was the idea of illusions of knowing and how we can use various strategies to overcome those illusions of knowing, these cognitive biases in our learning. So now that we've extracted some of the key ideas, what's my overall take on the book Make It Stick? Well, first and foremost, the book is brilliant. It's a classic in the science of learning, and that's why I've chosen to review it. And I think there's very few books on the bookshelf that, are, that can give you a better overview of the key principles from the science of learning that can be just readily applied in your teaching and learning practice. However, the book's not perfect. Despite it doing a great job of sorting fact from fiction, I would have liked to have seen some more balanced critical insights around, say, contested ideas of research from the learning sciences. For example, it refers to Robert Sternberg's triarchic theory of intelligence as if it were widely validated by intelligence researchers. And yet, that's not necessarily the case. And the book makes little mention of psychometric G, or what we call the G factor, the general factor of intelligence, which has overwhelming support among psychometricians and experts in cognitive ability. I also had some minor reservations about their reference to growth mindset because it made mention of that theory in a way that I think leaves the lay reader unaware of its relative position within the literature as a hotly contested, dubious, or even in some people's eyes, a defunct theory. With that being said, I'd still highly recommend this book because it's jam-packed with key principles from the science of learning. It's got a compelling narrative to bring it all together beautifully. Uh, it's well written, and I think you can't go wrong in reading that book as a starting point if you're beginning your journey into the science of learning. So be sure to delve into the book, try out the learning techniques that it suggests, and share your experiences and insights in the comments below. And remember that knowledge isn't power unless it first sticks in your mind and in your memory. So read the darn book and help make it stick. And as Brown and colleagues remind us, it's not just what you know, but how you practice what you know that determines how well the learning serves you later. Thanks so much for listening. If you like this video and you got value out of it, hit the like and the subscribe button and you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks for listening.